Hello, hello. Uh, hello to everyone who is joining us. Uh, as always, it'll be a few minutes uh, before everyone uh, enters. So we'll give a few minutes before we get started. But uh, we're not going to wait too long because we have a lot of really great information here. And I know that you have all come because you're very interested in uh, learning about how being a digital nomad will affect your taxes and tax season is upon us. Uh, so I'm also really, really excited to be here with Crystal from Nomad Tax and we're gonna get started pretty soon. Um, but first I would love to hear um, in the chat where everyone is calling in from and how people are feeling about their tax season coming up. If you're feeling really good, really prepared, or maybe you're here because you're feeling a little bit nervous or curious about um, how the digital nomad or remote work lifestyle might impact your taxes. Um, even if you're not yet a remote worker or digital nomad, maybe planning for the future. Um, so of course, in the chat box, you can just write in, uh, make sure you select everyone, not just host and panelists so that everyone can see your answer and just let us know where you're calling in from and how you're feeling um, about tax season. Uh, so we will get started in a few minutes, um, but for some housekeeping, um, I will have the chat box and the Q&A open uh, while Crystal is presenting, and I will monitor those, uh, and we'll have plenty of time at the end to do some Q&A. Um, so feel free, as we're going along through the presentation, to, to put your questions in the Q&A or the chat box. Uh, the Q&A is great because people can also upvote um, it, the questions that they want to have answered. Um, but the chat will work fine um, as well. And um, and I will introduce myself first. I'm Lindsay. I am head of community and events at Outsite. Outsite offers uh, accommodations, perks, events, and community for digital nomads, remote workers, creatives, uh, and the like. Um, and we put on events just like this to um, share with our community uh, tips and tricks uh, about either, you know, doing your taxes if you're already a digital nomad or remote worker, or maybe if you're considering the lifestyle and just want to know how it's going to um, impact your taxes. Um, both are great. We're happy to have you here. Um, I'll get some people in the chat. It's nice to nice to hear from you from Vancouver. Wonderful. It might be quite cold there. Um, I'm actually calling in from our uh, newest location in Portugal in Porto. It's called Outside Moco. It's really really incredible. I'm sitting here in one of the uh, phone booths in the Cowork Cafe. Um, this location not only has a beautiful co-work cafe, it has a cafe, it also has meeting rooms, and it actually has a, a concert venue that holds about 300 people. Um, and we host uh, local Portuguese acts and international acts. Um, I highly, highly recommend this location um, if you are interested in visiting um, Portugal. It's really, really wonderful, and um, the city is great here. Um, so thank you to everyone who is joining us. It looks like we're having a few more people trickle in. Um, so we'll give it just a few more moments and uh, and get started shortly. Uh, we have a, a great mix of people here, Oregon, Seattle, uh, Vancouver, Switzerland, planning to become a digital nomad in the near future, calling in from London. Um, this tax webinar, uh, I believe, will be mostly U.S. centric. I'll let Crystal answer that in um, in a little bit more detail. Um, Crystal, it, will this be focused mostly on the U.S.? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I am an advisor for for the United States, and that's basically what I can I can chat about here. There's a few things outside of that that I've kind of picked up, you know, in in six years being a digital nomad account at like digital nomad visas and that kind of stuff. But as far as the tax advice goes, it will be U.S. centric. Thank you. Oh, I see uh, Clara's also calling in um, from Portugal. Uh, where in Portugal are you, Clara? I'm in Porto. Um, I'm actually doing a little bit of a, a Portugal tour. Um, after this, I will be heading down all the way to the south to our location in Sagres, to Ereceira, Cascais, and finally Lisbon before I um, head home. Oh, Clara's uh, in the Algarves too. That's where I'll be heading. Um, I hope that the weather is a little bit better here than rainy, rainy Porto, but I'm loving the city uh, regardless. Well, thank you to everyone uh, who shared in the chat. Uh, I'm actually going to turn it over to Crystal now uh, after I introduce myself for the people who have just come in. 
I'm Lindsay. I'm head of community and events for Outsight. Um, we offer accommodation and co-working spaces for digital nomads and remote workers. We also have events, uh, perks, and community. Um, and we're here today to talk about how uh, being a digital nomad or a remote worker uh, is going to impact our taxes. And I'm here with Crystal from Nomad Tax, and I'm going to turn it over to Crystal now. Hey, everybody. Thanks for taking the time to join. Um, I know taxes isn't the most um, riveting topic that there is, but it is an important one to learn, especially what are the nuances of your taxes when you are a digital nomad. And this means maybe like in your home country or the countries that you're traveling in, kind of what does this new location independent lifestyle mean when it comes to taxes? So We'll cover as much as we can. I'm definitely going to leave it kind of an open format. So if you have questions, I'll pause and, and leave time for that. Um, but yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, first, a little bit about me. Uh, so my name is Crystal Pino. Uh, most of the people in the travel community know me as Pino. I've been going by my last name um, for that long. Um, you'll <laughs> Even my friends, sometimes somebody will say Crystal and they'll be like, who's Crystal? Um, but anyways, um, I'm a CPA. Um, I have a BA in accounting and a BA in international finance. Um, I've been a CPA for, gosh, almost 10 years now. Um, I have five years of corporate accounting experience before working three years in public accounting. Um, and then I left to go on my digital nomad journey, uh, which is where I ended up starting Nomad Tax. And this is our uh, seventh, sixth tax season. I believe it's our sixth tax season. Uh, yeah, so sixth tax season running Nomad Tax. Um, and it's really great. Uh, I'm also an entrepreneur and a digital nomad myself. Um, I started my digital nomad journey almost seven years ago. Uh, crazy to think that it's been so long. Um, and along the way, um, I became an entrepreneur and started a nomad tax. So a lot of the, the topics that we'll talk about today, not only was I trained in through my career, but I learned for myself. So I like to share all that information with you guys. A little bit of legal stuff first, right? Obviously, this presentation is meant to be a high level review of these topics and in no way represents specific advice. Um, I'm definitely available if you want specific advice, but anything that you learn in this webinar, just know that it's kind of a high level, um, high level summary and um, does not uh, apply to your particular facts and circumstances. Now, like I said, taxes are boring. So I, I cannot believe we got 45 of you here to actually give up time on your on your your day here to listen to me talk about taxes. Uh, but there's a lot of good information in here. So the number one thing people want to know about when it comes to digital nomad taxes is the foreign earned income exclusion. This is the question that I get the most. Now, we lovingly call it the FEIE because the foreign earned income exclusion is quite the mouthful. All right, so let's talk about it. What is the foreign earned income exclusion? The foreign earned income exclusion is a provision in the United States tax code that allows for an exemption of your income from federal income taxes, given that you meet a certain set of requirements. And we'll go through all of those requirements and we'll leave time for questions as well. Um, <clears throat> If you qualify, um, in 2023, the foreign earned income exclusion was 120,000. For 2024, it's 126,500, which means that you can, if you qualify, you can exempt up to that much of income from federal income taxes. Um, it's just a federal level uh, provision. Uh, the regulations do vary from state to state. Um, so there are you know, a good handful of states that also offer the FEIE. Meaning if you qualify on a federal level, you would also qualify on a state level. So you, if you're in one of those states, um, you can, um, if you're in one of those states, you can also apply it to your state taxes. Um, it does not apply to Social Security, Medicare, and self-employment taxes. Self-employment taxes basically are Social Security and Medicare. They just like call them something different. Um, so you would still be responsible for paying that Social Security, Medicare, and our self-employment taxes as well. Um, I saw a quick question pop up there in the chat. Um, it it does apply if you make more than 120, but the income above uh, the income above the threshold um, would be taxed as as it normally would. Um, so you would still qualify. You just qualify to exempt up to so that first 120, and then anything over that would be regular taxed. People want to know how does it work. Uh, basically, there's two ways to qualify. One is called the physical presence test. Most digital nomads are using this physical presence test. Now the physical presence test is a little wonky, so we'll walk through it together. But the physical presence test says that 
in any 365 days, you need to spend 330 of those days present in a foreign country. Now, any 365 day period, rolling days, what does that mean? It means it does not have to be a calendar year. It can be any consecutive 365 days. January 1 to December 31st makes the math a little bit easier, but that doesn't mean Sixty-five day period that you want, <clears throat> as long as during that 30, 365 day period you spent three hundred and thirty of those days present in a foreign company, uh, foreign country. Sorry, um, present in a foreign country. What does this mean? Present in a foreign country means boots on the ground, actually physically in that country for the twelve hour period that is midnight to midnight. This really only comes into play when you're transiting in and out of the United States, right? So if you're transiting between foreign countries, not so much crazy unless you're like in this crazy like 24-hour travel day where you're crossing like multiple oceans. And if that's your situation, then definitely talk to me and we'll figure it out. But a lot of times it's just when you're transiting outside of the United States, right? So you leave the U.S. and say you land in, you know, France at 9 a.m., that's not your first day in a foreign country. Your first day in a foreign country is not till that midnight to midnight. Same as when you fly back. So if you're leaving Mexico City and you leave Mexico City, um, <clears throat> you leave Mexico City at 10 p.m. at night, well, you didn't spend a full day in Mexico City. Um, so that's how the present in a foreign country works. Foreign countries is defined as basically that. Um, the exclusions from foreign countries are um, restricted countries, which are currently... Cuba, Iran, and North Korea. A lot of us probably aren't going to Iran or North Korea, but a lot of people do like to check out Cuba. Just please know that right now it does not count as time in a foreign country. Time spent in international waters does not count as time spent in a foreign country either. Um, so those of you who are interested in something like Nomad Cruise, um, just know that those days spent out at sea do not count. Um, and Antarctica, funnily enough, is not a country. It is a continent. And therefore, time spent in Antarctica does not count as time spent in a foreign country. I mentioned this one because Antarctic cruises seem to become start becoming very, very popular um, recently. Um, so just know that that doesn't count. Um, so that's the 330 days. Uh, tax home outside of the U.S. Now, your tax home is where you physically are when you earn your money. Um, so if you are physically outside of the United States, I usually say by by qualification of, you know, qualifying for the physical presence test, the, the days test, you qualify for the tax home test too, right? Because you are physically working outside of the country. country. Um, and having your abode outside of the U.S. The abode is a little bit of a crazier test. That one tests like socioeconomic and um, familial ties. Um, it's kind of like the third test. So it's not, at, it's still important, but it's not as important as the other, other three. Um, so that is the physical presence test. The bona fide residence, residence test is just that. It's for those of us who have kind of moved to another country and gotten residency there. I've been living in Mexico City for the past almost two years now. Um, so I have residency here in Mexico City. You do not need residency in a country to qualify for the bona fide residence test. It is the strongest piece of evidence that you can offer. However, uh, you, they can look at other things, you know, such as the type of visa that you're on, if you have a long-term lease in a place. Um, you know, a lot of times you'll look at like like relationships, you know, like, you know, somebody's boyfriend or their, you know, girlfriend lives there. Um, you know, it, it's kind of like whenever they do travel, where do they intend to return to? Where does your stuff live? Um, so bona fide residence is a lot more facts and circumstances than this kind of cut and dry of the physical presence test. Um, so this is the two tests that you use to qualify. Caveats for the foreign earned income exclusion is that it only applies to earned income. So earned income is basically that money that you earn either from self-employment or uh, a W-2 job compensation. Um, it does not apply to interest, dividends, capital gains, unemployment income, um, anything, anything of that kind of nature. And there's a really interesting sentence in the foreign earned income exclusion that says that your travel must be for an indefinite period. Indefinite period means just kind of that, you know, um, that you don't have a set plan to go back. Um, in the years that I have been preparing these tax returns, thousands of digital nomad tax returns, I have only seen one foreign earned income exclusion denied. And that is when um, a client of mine went and traveled on remote year. So remote year is a one-year program. Um, she promptly left remote year, moved back to Miami, bought a condo, 
um, met somebody, got married, got an in-office job, um, all within like a year. So when the IRS kind of came back and they looked at her case, they said, well, your travel obviously wasn't for an indefinite period. Um, so that's the only time that I've seen it um, denied. Um, so just know that travel is an indefinite period. Uh, this is just kind of a thing about how the physical presence test is like, did you spend 330 days outside? If you didn't make the 330 days, that's it. There's, there's no, oh, I made 75% of it, or I made 95% of it. It's 330 days or nothing. Um, if you meet the 330, uh, days, then we say, yes, you might qualify. Then we kind of look at the tax code and abode tests. Some uh, frequently asked questions that we get. Um, people want to know, do I have to be paying taxes to another country? There's nothing in these provisions that says that you have to be paying taxes to another country. There are a lot of things in there that say if you are required to pay taxes to another country, you need to be paying taxes to another country. Um, but a lot of times that's between you and that other country. Keep in mind that the foreign earned income exclusion was written 40 years ago before remote work and location independent work was a thing. So it wasn't written for our specific situation. We're kind of operating under this loophole situation. Uh, people want to know, what if I'm a W-2 employee of a company? Um, you can still use the foreign earned income exclusion because it's, it's about where you are when you perform the work and not where your company is located or where your clients are located for that matter. So if your clients are located in the U.S., it still doesn't matter. You can use this. And like, once again, people are like, well, how does this work that I'm just not paying taxes to anybody? Like I said, this <clears throat> this iteration of the foreign earned income exclusion was not written for digital nomads. Digital nomads was not even a thing when um, when it came out. Um, so that being said, the IRS is really good at closing loopholes. So I would expect um, that at some point in the not too distant future, um, this will be rewritten. rewritten. There has been talk about what that will look like when it is rewritten, um, getting rid of the physical presence test um, in favor of something like a 183 day test. Um, there might be some more requirements around taxes to other countries, but really there's just no way to know um, until they rewrite it um, and, and see where they, they take it with that. Uh, before we jump into state taxes, is, is I covered a lot of information there. Um, Lindsay, are there any questions in the chat that we should go ahead and address now? I uh, there are a lot of questions in the chat. Um, let's see. Really are. <laughs> um, and also uh, remember that you can put your question in the in the Q and A box too. Um, it, it's a little bit easier there. Um, but let me just take a look here. Uh, yes, there will be a replay. <laughs> Um, Samantha asks, how does the abode outside the U.S. Uh, work when you're in a different home or country every month or so as a nomad? Uh, yeah, so the abode test, the abode test is a weird one, right? Because it's like where you're going to see economic ties. Now, most of the time, what it is, is none of us really, we don't have an abode. Um, we qualify under what's called an itinerant status, uh, which means that you kind of don't have ties anywhere. You're continuing to change your home. Um, that itinerant status makes a couple of things pretty pretty weird, like taking travel expenses for small businesses, which we'll cover a little bit later. Um, but that's kind of how it works. It's another one of those statutes that was like written before nomadic work was a thing. Um, so currently you have this thing where you have kind of this itinerant abode, meaning that you kind of travel and you, and you don't have one, basically. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I think that's the only one about foreign income uh, exclusion. So we'll save, um, actually, maybe one more. Hold on. Um, how do you prove to the IRS that you are present outside the U.S.? Flights, passport stamps? Yes. Um, when you fill out a tax return, any tax return, whether you're taking the foreign earned income exclusion or not, when you sign that tax return, um, it basically says, you know, under penalty of perjury, I say that all of this information is true and complete. Um, and so you have to submit kind of your travel schedule with the foreign earned income exclusion um, to show that you qualify for it. Um, if the IRS wants more data, they will likely ask for travel itineraries, flight bookings, passport stamps, um, probably kind of that kind of stuff. So I say if you're planning on uh, filing for the foreign earned income exclusion, make sure you track your travel. I use a Google sheet. It's you know simple. This is the country. This is the date that I entered. This is the date that I exited. Um, and then just make sure that you have kind of backup for those, um, that stuff. If, because if you are audited, it's likely going to be two or three years down the road and you're not going to remember. So having that information accessible somewhere, most of us have it in like a Gmail folder. Um, it's helpful. 
Okay, and are amendments for prior years uh, a somewhat simple process? Does Nomad Tax provide this service? Uh, amendments are a relatively um, easy process. Um, and yes, we do prepare amended returns. We do a lot of amended returns, especially for people who didn't realize they had qualified and they want to go back and they claim it. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, amendments are, are very popular. Uh, one thing that I will say about amendments is it does require the IRS to take a second look at things. Um, so if an amendment can be avoided, um, I would, I would lean towards that way. And the specific situation that might apply to that is, well, gee, I don't off, I don't qualify for the FEIE by tax filing date, but I want to go ahead and get some of my refund now and then file an amended tax return later and claim the FEIE. Now that's a case where I might recommend like an extension instead of an amendment, um, just because it doesn't require the IRS taking a second look at your return. Um, but if it's truly just, you know, oh, I didn't realize I qualify for this and I do and I want to go back and amend my return, then yeah, that's that's pretty normal. And it is a service we provide. Okay. Um, would the IRS ever contact uh, a W-2 U.S. employer if they happen to get audited? This is a big I don't know. Um, usually, no. There's usually no reason for the IRS to contact your employer. Um, that being said, um, there is this kind of thing where I don't know if you employed people have ever noticed when you're filling out your W-9 for the year <laughs> that you can check a box to say that you're exempt from federal withholdings. Um, and some people who claim the FEIE, almost everybody who claims the FEIE wants to do this because it means that they won't withhold federal taxes from your paycheck and you have more money each month to spend on flights or Airbnbs or invest in the market, whatever it is. Um, I usually don't recommend this um, unless you are 110% sure that you're going to qualify for the FEIE. Only two of my clients do it, and they've been traveling for eight years plus. Um, so they're very solid in this lifestyle. Um, because what can happen is if you're if you don't end up qualifying for the FEIE for any reason, you know, your grandmother got sick, you had to come home, you busted your days, whatever it is. Um, and your employer didn't withhold enough taxes, you and your employer can get in trouble, right? So that is one instance where the IRS and your employer could kind of be in the same boat. Other than that, up until now, I have never seen any reason for the IRS to contact an employer about an individual's tax return outside of that situation. That's not to say it can't happen. It's just to say that I haven't seen it in my 10 years as a CPA. Okay. Um, and again, yes, this is going to be generally geared more towards uh, those of us in uh, the U.S., um, but do you potentially have any uh, resources that we can send out to, to folks of other uh, countries or maybe places that we can uh, direct them? Yeah, um, I do have. So I, I've noticed there's a couple Canadians in here. Um, I do have a Canadian tax advisor um, that kind of works in the same space that I could refer out to. I had a little bit of trouble finding them in Europe. I think, you know, Europe's tax laws are just a little more lenient, maybe, um, you know, with the EU and everything. So I haven't found any good European partners um, yet, unfortunately. But for the Canadians in the group, I do have a contact that should be able to help you out on that side. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And I think we have one more FEIE uh, before we um, move on. And um, this person is wondering, what if they've established themselves as a bona fide foreign resident expat for many years, and they're now spending more time in the U.S., even if their business is outside of the U.S.? Um, okay, so they're a resident of another country. Mm-hmm. Um, how much time, how much time, it depends on how much time you, let me just answer that question instead of asking a question. <laughs> um, it depends on how much time you're actually spending in the United States. The bona fide residency test is great because it removes that days restriction, right? You no longer have to be counting your days. You can spend a lot more time in the United States. It's one of the reasons I went after Mexican residency. My sister just had another baby. You know, my dad's kind of having some health problems. I wanted this freedom and flexibility to travel to the U S more. Um, while there is no days restriction on the bona fide residency test, it does have some kind of guidelines. Um, you don't really want to be spending more than four months in the United States um, because then you're kind of going to kind of start jeopardizing that status um, by spending more time in the United States. Um, all right. And then 
this person is asking, um, well, they're saying that they thought if you were a U.S. citizen, you were always liable to pay U.S. taxes wherever you live in the world unless you give up your citizenship. You are. The United States is the only developed country in the world that has what we call a citizenship based taxation system. The majority of the world operates on a residence based taxation system, meaning if you're a resident of that country, certain years. I saw somebody put in the chat or the Q&A something about, you know, most European countries, it's that 180 days, right? You know, so you have to spend once you hit 180 or 183 days, then you become liable for taxes, right? The United States is the only place in the world where you know, if you have a U.S. passport, you're liable for taxes no matter what. That's where this exclusion comes in, right? And the foreign tax credit, which we'll, we'll touch upon. It's not as popular um, in these things, but um, yes, that's why we have these exclusions and the credits, because you're always liable for taxes in the United States, but we can exclude some of your income if you're not spending all your time there. Okay, thank you. I think we'll move on for now and, and save some time for questions at the end. Yeah. yeah. All right. The next biggest question that I always get from people is state taxes, right? They're like, do I have to pay state taxes? Um, I don't spend any time in my state. I haven't been there in forever. Um, gosh, it would be really nice if, if that's the way that it worked. Unfortunately, um, the United States, there are certain things that are considered a privilege of being a resident of a state, things like driver's license and voter's registration. Um, and typically, you are considered a resident of a state until you establish residency elsewhere, right? So you were living in Colorado before you decided to be a digital nomad. You left. You still have your Colorado driver's license. You still vote via Colorado. Guess what? You're still liable for Colorado taxes. Um, this, The two ways out of this kind of are um, not kind of the two ways out of this are the bona fide residence test. Right. Once you're a bona fide resident of another place, that's the place you're a resident of, not the United States anymore. Um, but you still have to be careful about the things like the driver's license and your voter's registration or what a lot of nomads are doing is before they nomad or now once they realize it, um, they establish residency in no income tax states. Um, so the no income tax states are Alaska, Florida, New Hampshire, Nevada, South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas, Washington, and Wyoming. Um, establishing residency in a no income tax state means that you can have a driver's license, you can be registered to vote there, and you don't have to worry about state taxes. Um, secondarily, you could establish yourself in a state that has the foreign earned income exclusion as well. Um, so if that's one of your states and you're making under the exclusion for the year, <clears throat> that could be a good a good um, solution. Um, so so yes, you are a resident of the state that you were a resident of when you started on your digital nomad journey until you establish residency somewhere else. Establish residency in a no income tax state if that's something that you're worried about, or check and see if your state has the foreign earned income exclusion. And if it does, then you can just apply that. Um, some states are more aggressive than others. California is the worst, absolute worst. If you are a resident of California, you will be a resident of California until you, until you die. And even then they might try to get taxes from you. Um, California is interesting, uh, because they all, they're the most aggressive at chasing their residents. So people who change residency, they also don't recognize the foreign earned income exclusion, which means they don't recognize that you've left your residency in California when you move to another country. Um, so I have clients who are now living in Mexico who used to be California residents, and we are currently in a residency audit with California. And they're like, well, we don't recognize your residency in Mexico, even though they've lived there for six years. <laughs> and um, one of my team members is actually, you know, he married a woman, lives in Baja Sur in Mexico, and he still pays California taxes because he was a California resident beforehand. Um, so what should people from California do? Great question, Elena established residency in a different state, <laughs> either a no income tax state um, or a state with a foreign earned income exclusion and or a state that recognizes when you move to another country. Um, it's absolutely absurd. Uh, I can't explain it. Um, I just report the facts. So don't shoot the messenger on that one. Um, a lot of my clients come from New York. Uh, New York is unique in the other way. And that New York has something called the 548 day rule. Uh, the 548 day rule is 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 really great because New York recognizes it says if in a 548 day period, which is basically a year and a half, if you spend less than 
some really wacky calculation that works out to be basically about 40 days. In a 548 day period, if you spend less than 40 days present in the state of New York, you are no longer considered a New York resident for tax purposes. So you can still have your New York driver's license, you can still be registered to vote in New York, you can still have your New York address, but you're not a tax resident for New York purposes. There's several clients that are in this boat. It's really kind of a nice, a nice gesture on a state taxing authority. It's not really uh not really common. Um, but that's the the that's kind of um, a provision that's out there for my New York residents. For the rest of you who are like, okay, well, let's just establish residency in an income tax state. Um, getting an address in that state is not sufficient for changing your residency. You do need to get a driver's license. You do need to register to vote. You do need to change any state-run insurance plans that you have. So if you're on a state health insurance exchange, you need to move that state health insurance exchange. If you're employed, you need to have your employer classify you as an employee of your new state. Um, it is not as simple as just changing your address. And some states are easier to set up in than others. If you have a relative in any of these states, probably the easiest way um, if they'll allow you to use their address. <clears throat> we were really big on um, recommending South Dakota for a long, long time. Um, South Dakota kind of set itself as part in the, in the RV community. Um, as a place for uh, people who were not spending a lot of time in one state. Um, and it was easy. You could get residency there in one day. This past year, I think South Dakota recognized that they were having an, an, un an unusually large influx of residents. Um, and for reasons that I can only surmise were political, um, they started pushing back. And the way that they pushed back was with unemployment insurance. Um, so now in South Dakota, in order to qualify for unemployment insurance, you have to prove that you physically work in South Dakota, digital nomads. We don't. Um, and if you can't prove that, then your unemployment insurance gets kicked back to either the state where you are working, which is for digital nomads working outside of the U S there is none or the state where your company is headquartered. Um, and having unemployment insurance through a state means that you're also subject to state taxes in that state. Um, so this is kind of this this new thing, you know, where HR and payroll companies haven't figured out how to split these two things. Um, and basically what it means for tax purposes is I'm not recommending South Dakota to people anymore because they've, they've pulled this one thing. Who knows what they'll do next? Um, Texas and Florida are a little bit easier to set up in. Um, there's a program out there called escapees it's actually for the rv community um they have programs where they can help you get set up in texas things like renting an rv lot you know for a year and you pay the rent on that lot and that's your address and now you're a resident of, of texas using that address so these are kind of some of the 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 ways that you can get around state taxes but just just so you know just because you don't spend time in a state doesn't mean that you don't have still have a tax obligation to that state and states are typically more aggressive than the IRS. Um, states' main source of revenue is income taxes, and therefore they are a lot more aggressive at going after people when they don't get the taxes that they expect. Uh, I touched on the foreign tax credit earlier. Um, the foreign tax credit is also something that's available. This is mostly for people who are paying foreign taxes in, an, in another country. It is a dollar for dollar credit for taxes paid to a foreign country in your home country. So if you are on a digital nomad visa in Spain and you end up owing $10,000 in taxes to Spain, you get a $10,000 credit on your taxes in the United States. So dollar for dollar credit. Um, you can use either the foreign tax credit or the foreign earned income exclusion on the same income. You cannot use both. So meaning if you make $100,000 a year and you pay $10,000 to Spain and you say, well, should I use the foreign tax credit or the foreign earned income exclusion? We usually calculate it both ways and see which one gets you the most deduction, right? Um, usually it's the foreign earned income exclusion. Sometimes it's the foreign tax credit. However, if you make $150,000 a year, you can use the foreign earned income exclusion on the first 120 and the foreign tax credit on the next 30 right? Because it's not the same income. So you can't use the foreign tax credit and the FDIE on the same income, but you can stack them. So that's the foreign tax credit. Uh, all right. So before we talk, uh, jump into 
kind of what this looks like for freelancers and independent contractors and small businesses. Does anybody have any other questions on the individual tax side? We do have uh, some some state tax questions. Um, All right. So uh, if you have never lived in the U.S. but are a U.S. citizen, do you have to declare a state as part of your taxes? This person was born in California. If so, can they pick any state, no income tax state? Does that mean it would become their voting home too? You know, that's an interesting question that I don't have an answer to. I would have to look into that. I'm not sure. Okay, well, um, this person uh, can reach out to you and maybe you can work together to to figure out the answer. Uh, to this. I'm curious now too. I love when people pitch me situations that I've never, I've never seen in my, my seven years doing digital nomad taxes. So <laughs> I'd like to figure that one out. We like a fun challenge. Happy to hear that. Yeah. Uh, we do have another mm -hmm. one. Uh, what about living for significant amounts of times in states with taxes, although not a resident there, for example, Oregon, do you have to pay taxes in multiple states? Yes, you do. Um, and the rules are different for every state. I call it the United States of America until it comes to taxes. Every state has their own rules. Um, it depends on <clears throat> one of two measures, either how much time you spent in the state or how much money you earned in the state. And sometimes it's a combination of the two. Um, so each state has their own threshold of time spent or money earned there before you start owing taxes in that state. Generally, what happens if you owe taxes in a state that's not your home state you can get a credit back in your home state for taxes paid to other states. Um, but that is something that needs to be looked into on an, on an individual basis. But yes, if you do spend a um, significant amount of time in other states that are not your home state, you could be subject to income taxes there. Um, thank you. Are there uh, litmus tests built into TurboTax or other tax softwares? Like would it ask the relevant questions to determine the conclusions for you? Likely not. Um, and that's when that that's where uh, I'll be the first person to tell you if you do or do not need our services. I am aware we are not the cheapest thing on the market. Um, and and TurboTax or even for that matter, the IRS free file tool is wonderful for a majority of situations. Right. There are levels when you start to hit a certain level where TurboTax is just no longer going to get you where you need to get. Um, and I say this because the majority of returns that we end up amending are from TurboTax and they don't ask you kind of the right questions to get you to where you need to be. Um, so, you know, in one of those situations is kind of multi, multi-state tax situations, right? Um, you would have to, I think TurboTax itself is probably not going to get you there. You could get yourself there on TurboTax. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. Once you start getting into a multi-state tax situation, that's probably when you should look into, um, you know, at least getting some tax advice, if not hiring an advisor to to prepare your return. And we'll, of course, um, send out all of Crystal's info if you'd like to work with her um, in our in our post-event communications. Uh, so if you have, you know, kind of specialized circumstances or, um, you know, complicated circumstances, um, you'll be able to contact her very easily if you uh, would like to work with her. Um, and then we have one more question. If you're nomading for shorter periods of time outside of the U.S., for example, one to two months at a time, and then back to your resident state, how do you handle taxes? Just like you normally would. There's there's nothing really special about your situation. You would have to pay taxes for the entire time, um, even with the uh, spending spending one to two months outside, you would still owe U.S. taxes. So so you have a simple return. I would I would recommend the IRS free file tool in that sense. All right, that's that's good to know. Um, I guess we can we can keep moving uh, on the presentation and and continue to save some time at the end for um, mm -hmm. catch all of questions. Yes. Uh, all right. So let's talk about those of us who are not employed and run our own businesses. Uh, there are se several business structures out there, ranging from complex to uh, simple to complex, and no tax benefits to a lot of tax benefits. Um, the first one is a sole proprietor. This is basically for the 1099 contractors, those of you who have not formed a company, who have not done anything, you're just kind of working as a freelancer. Um, a sole proprietor structure is uh, reported on a Schedule C. Um, the next step up from that is forming an LLC. Um, 1099s, business owners form LLCs. 
partnerships are another uh, tax structure that's out there. They're not as popular as they used to be. Um, partnerships aren't, aren't actually very tax advantageous anymore. They used to be, but with the changes in tax laws, it's, it's kind of a little different now. Um, it is kind of beneficial in some situations, especially when you have family-owned businesses or family-owned real estate, um, but you won't see a lot of partnerships. Um, with, I, don't, I don't see a lot of partnership within the digital nomad community. Um, S corporation is a, what I call a domestic structure, um, and domestic for those of us who are U S citizens. Um, it is a way to mitigate, um, some taxes within the United States. It's a hybrid stru structure between the LLC and the S corporation, taking some of the benefits from both while not having to be subject to some of the, uh, burdens of the other, uh, C corporation, um, it is the most formal structure out there. A C corporation has its own tax. Um, this structure is really popular if you want to bring on investors or if you're building up something that you want to sell. Uh, C corporation is, is a really good structure for that. And the rise in popularity of the International Business Corporation. The International Business Corporation allows is probably the most complex structure. It allows for the most tax savings for digital nomads. Um, but just know that it, it does have some kind of work involved with it. Uh, so which one is right for you? It depends on your individual situation, right? You can see that the sole prop LLC partnership and S Corp are taxed at a personal level. These are all what we call pass through entities, which means that the income from the company passes through to you and you pay taxes on an individual level. Um, the sole prop is the simplest form because you don't have to do anything for it. The disadvantage is, is there's no liability protection um, and you have to pay what we call self-employment taxes. Self-employment taxes is 15.3% for Social Security and Medicare. When you're employed, you get to split this with your employer. You pay 7.65%, they pay 7.65%. When you're self-employed, you're responsible for the entire 15.3%. <clears throat> when we get into the S-Corp structure, the S-Corp is where... Um, you can start to limit that um, self-employment tax burden um, this, because what you do is you split the income of the company between salary and profit. You now become an employee of your own company. You pay yourself what's called reasonable compensation. Um, and only that is subject to the self-employment tax and your company gets a deduction for half of it. Um, the downside of the S corporation is there are additional tax um, reporting and filing burden. So there's a certain level of income where the S corp starts to make sense. Around sixty or seventy thousand if you're filing for FEIE, around one hundred and twenty if you're not. Um, before that, kind of the additional cost and reporting burdens aren't really worth it. The C corporation structure used to be immensely unpopular because it was thirty nine percent taxes on C corporations. However, in the past couple of years, the tax on a the corporate tax um, came down to about twenty percent. Um, so it's a lot less now. Um, you can, it allows you to kind of split the income tax burden with the company. If you're in a high income tax bracket, a C Corp is a good way to, um, put some of the income in a lower bracket. That disadvantages of this, uh, C corporations are subject to double taxation, meaning that you are taxed on the income when it goes into the company. And then you're taxed, um, from profit from the corporate tax. And then you're taxed when it comes out to you in the form of dividends, right? So there's some double taxation involved there. The IBC structure, as I said, has the least amount of tax. Um, it is a way to potentially eliminate all of your tax. Um, you know, you're not subject to, um, if this is structured right, you would not be subject to self-employment taxes. Um, you, if you plan it correctly, you could uh, eliminate your income tax burden. And the only thing that you could be subject to is something called guilty tax, global intangible low tax income. Um, but only that starts to happen at a level of, um, you know, around 150 to 200,000. Biggest disadvantage of this is the setup is costly. Um, but usually you can outweigh those costs within the first year. We talked about reasonable compensations for the S corporation. Reasonable compensation is very vaguely defined by the IRS. It is also a moving target. Um, that depends on a lot of things, um, including, you know, how much income you have earned, what the FEIE max is, how much effort you're putting into your business versus, um, you know, employees, you know, like if I have an S corporation, well, I have a team of 10, right? So, uh, ostentatiously, like I, if I couldn't work tomorrow, my business would still run and still make money. Whereas if you're a single member S corp owner, who's doing all the work, um, 
your reasonable compensation percentage might have to be higher, right? Because if you were to get sick and not be able to work, then your company doesn't make money anymore. Um, so these are just kind of things with reasonable compensation. Just know that like it does have to be paid. Um, the IRS is like with all of those agents that the IRS recently hired, you know, um, they one of the things they say that they were targeting was reasonable compensation on us corporations. So it is important to kind of get this number right each year. But just know that they get it. There's no set formula for it, unfortunately. Why well, I don't always recommend the S corporation for digital nomads or single member entities for that reason. Um, the tax savings that you realize comes from splitting income between salary and profit, right? I've just talked about reasonable compensation. Reasonable compensation, especially for single member entities, needs to be between 60 and 80%. Um, 60 and 80%, which means that you're still having to pay yourself a high amount, especially if we're looking at the FEIE, right? Because we might want to be hitting the FEIE max. Well, now you're still paying self-employment tax on all of your income. Um, you're having to deal with the extra costs and reporting burdens. There's more paperwork involved. There's more to do. Um, and with the S corporation, you kind of have less access to capital. I put this slide in here because if you go out on the internet, um, if you go out on the internet, you're going to see a thousand articles that says the S corp is the end all be all for small business owners, right? It's a one size fits all solution. Um, you know, nine out of 10 tax accounts that you talk to are going to tell you, you need to be an S corporation. Um, the, the S Corp and the FEIE, they don't exactly play nice in the sandbox together. I'm not saying that an S Corporation isn't the answer. All I'm saying is it shouldn't be an automatic to go to when you have other tax considerations. So definitely talk to somebody who specializes in digital nomads before an income exclusion when you're trying to figure out if an S Corp is, is right for you. Filing requirements on these um, Schedule C's is for your freelancers, independent contractors, single member LLCs. Form 1065 is for your multi-member LLCs and your partnerships, so an LLC with more than one owner. <clears throat> S corporations have to file an 1120S, and C corporations have to file an 1120C. Um, if you are a U.S. person who owns a foreign business, um, with the IBC structure, something we call a simple structure, um, you would file a Form 5471 that's just in your tax return, your personal tax return, so there's no additional tax return. Um, if you go with a more complex IBC structure, which might have your foreign company owning the U.S. LLC, foreign persons who own a U.S. business are required to form uh, file form 5472 with a uh, pro forma 1120, um, and forms 8804 and 8805 could come into play as well, right? So you can see that when we talk about simplicity of things, like a Schedule C is just in your personal tax return, that's super easy. All the way up to if you go with the complex foreign structure, you know, now you're looking at multiple forms, um, things that I like to call ABC returns, right? You know, there's just every form that you can think of in there. So more complex filing requirements. Um, we talk about people who want to know <laughs> what can I deduct for my business, right? I'm on the road, I'm a digital nomad, what can I deduct? Um, the IRS said that in order to be deductible as a business expense, it needs to be ordinary in your course of business, necessary in your course of business, and it cannot be considered a personal expense. So this is where I go to with my friends who do remote year and Wi-Fi tribe months who try to say that the entire thing was a business expense, right? You know, they were there, they were networking, they were meeting new people, they were building this product. And I say, did you get any personal benefit out of it at all? Um, because I think that if you sat across the table from an IRS advisor, they would say that you got some personal benefit out of spending a month, um, you know, uh, on these, on these chapters, <laughs> anything that's a personal expense cannot be considered a business expense. So a lot of times it's just going to take some finagling, right? Maybe a lot of things that you do are a partial business expense, but partial, um, partial personal expense as well. And that's going to take some evaluating on your part, um, you know, at, at each individual situation, risk tolerance comes into play. Um, a lot of times I tell people, you know, if, if you just want to take something as a business expense, would you feel comfortable sitting across the table from an IRS auditor defending it as a business expense? Because God forbid that one day you might be right. So that's kind of a litmus test for, for business expenses. <clears throat> Biggest one digital nomads want to know about is travel. Is my travel deductible? In order to deduct travel expenses, 
the IRS says that you must be traveling away from your tax home. Does tax home sound familiar? It should, because we talked about your tax home with the foreign earned income exclusion, right? The foreign earned income exclusions, we're saying my tax home is not in the United States. I'm traveling away from my tax, you know, I, you know, I'm travel. my tax home is traveling with me, right? That's how I qualify for the foreign earned income exclusion. You cannot then also double dip and say, but I want to take all these travel expenses because I'm traveling away from my tax home, right? So this is where it can get a little bit muddy with the foreign earned income exclusion and travel deductions. There's a lot of new careers around as well. Travel bloggers, travel writers. Um, one of my clients, she writes for Forbes, right? So she definitely has, like her travel is definitely a business expense because that's what she does. Um, but the tax code hasn't exactly caught up to this stuff yet. So you're really gonna have to be solid in your tax expense, in your travel expenses in order to deduct them, right? Um, because the IRS is, is going to want to see this tax home thing, but we're saying we're away from tax home, so we have to kind of apply these other other tests to it. I like to tell people that there's there's kind of three situations when you look at tax things, right? Um, I was living in Mexico City last year, and I, you know, was giving a presentation at a Nomad Festival in Bulgaria. Um, I flew to Bulgaria. I spent 10 days there, of which eight was the, the festival that I was presenting at, and then I flew back to Mexico City, right? My sole purpose for going there was business. I was presenting at this conference. That was it, right? Did I have some personal benefit while I was there? Probably, but I flew. I was living in Mexico City. I flew away from my tax home for business purposes, and I flew right back home after. 100% of all of that's deductible. My flights, my hotels, the meals that I had while I was there, everything's deductible, right? Um, second situation is, you know, I, when I was fully nomading, I decided that I wanted to go to Georgia. A girlfriend of mine had just opened a co-working there in Tbilisi. Um, I really wanted to visit her. Um, so I went and I spent six weeks in Georgia. While I was there, she said, Hey, do you want to give a tax presentation to our residents here? And I said, yeah, sure. I'd love to. Right. And from that, I had a couple coffees with people. We talked about taxes, but what was the purpose of my trip? Right. I might have done some business and networking when I was there, but I went there for personal reasons. So none of that trip is deductible. A lot of stuff is going to fall somewhere in the middle. I presented at a Cape Town uh, digital nomad conference in Cape Town, right? It was in November. And any of you who've been there know that that's the perfect time of year to be in Cape Town, right? So the conference was a week, but I ended up staying two months because I love to hike and some of the best hiking in the world. Um, that's something where it's, um, a percentage, right? A percentage of my travel was for business. A percentage of my accommodations was for business, but there was also a personal aspect, right? So that could be like a little percentage. So it takes some finagling when it comes to um, travel expenses. The other one, the question that I get is about home office deduction. Everyone wants to deduct um, their air, a portion of their Airbnb um, as their home office. We all work from home. Uh, I work from home. This is my home office. This is not a fun background. This is actually the wallpaper in our guest bedroom. Um, <laughs> um, the IRS tax code, this is another place where it hasn't caught up to work from home or remote work at all yet. The IRS says that in order to deduct your home office, it has to be a dedicated office, a dedicated space in your home that is used exclusively for work purposes and nothing else. That means your kitchen table, your couch, your bed, um, your countertops, whatever it is that you're working from in your Airbnb doesn't qualify for the IRS, right? Um, also, the IRS says that temporary housing doesn't count. Now, it specifically mentions hotels. It specifically mentions things in that realm. Airbnb is not in there. Um, but you're saying, okay, well, I have a second room and it is used as an office. Great. You can deduct it. Uh, make sure you take pictures because as an IRS auditor, has questions about your home office, they're not gonna fly to Thailand to verify that you had a second bedroom. So unless you can substantiate it, they're just gonna disallow it. Um, so that's where the home office deduction is now. I expect to see the tax law change around this sooner rather than later with the advent of remote work becoming so popular. Um, the home office deduction is really just, it's very poorly written for the new state of work, not just digital nomad work, but remote work in general. Here's a handy dandy little thing, and we will provide you the slides afterwards too, so that you can see, do your business uh, deduction travel counts, so you can kind of go through this and say, you know, does it count or not? Um, 
And then I also like to say, uh, every time somebody asks me if it's a business expense, my favorite tax answer is it depends. Um, and not just for business expenses, for a lot of tax. People like to think that tax is very cut and dry. And there are some areas where it is, but a lot of times it's open to interpretation, right? And that's going to depend on you, the IRS, and hopefully not, but an IRS auditor. Um, there's a risk tolerance factor. Um, you know, I have some people who are very comfortable deducting XYZ as 100% business expense, like their cell phone. And, you know, I have some people that say, eh, I mean, I play on Instagram on it all day. I really think that I shouldn't deduct any of it. And then you have people who fall in the middle. Uh, so it's a sliding scale and people fall all over it. Um, tips and tricks about being nomads. Uh, just a few little extra things here. Um, definitely get a credit card with no foreign transaction fees. Um, you're going to be <laughs> using it a lot in foreign places. Transaction fees can start to start to crush you for sure. Um, big one for me, have a secondary ATM card that never has more money on it than you're willing to lose, right? I have a bank where all of my money lives. That's where my money, money lives. And I never use the debit card for that account because I did once in my first year of travel in Bali. And by the time I got to Buenos Aires, they had emptied my account out of multiple, multiple thousand dollars. Um, so now I have a secondary ATM card that never has more than $500 in it. And I just transfer money into it when I need to. And that's the card that I use, right? Because for me, $500, I can lose $500. It's not the end of the day. It's not the end of the world. Travel insurance is always a big question. Again, we go back to risk tolerance. Um, you know, recent, I've been traveling for seven years and I haven't had kind of insurance during health insurance during that whole time. But last year I twisted my ankle and ended up having to have ankle surgery, right? Would have been $10,000 in Mexico. Very helpful to have insurance in that issue. I also got stranded in Bali when that volcano erupted. Um, I have been um, caught on, on other travel trips. I was robbed in Bariloche, Argentina when I was at a wedding one time. Um, and these are places where my travel insurance really came through for me. Uh, multiple thousand dollar claim, claims um, that really kind of helped soothe over the bumps that come with traveling. So again, it comes down to risk tolerance. I found it very helpful in my travels. It's up to you. Um, all right, we have questions. I saw somebody who wanted to take a screenshot of the business deductions worksheet. So I'm gonna go back to that for you as soon as I can figure out how to use um how to use things. All right, I'll let y'all take a to a, a gander at that and uh we'll go back to see who else has questions. Yes, there are quite a few questions in here. I think next time we do this, we'll um, maybe dedicate an hour and a half because I, I don't know if we're going to be able to get to all of these because um, we are actually doing um, another uh, event after this, uh, an online meditation on abundance, which goes nicely with our topic today. Um, but I saw an interesting question. Um, besides QuickBooks, what other apps would you recommend for freelancers, self-employed people, and businesses? Mm. QuickBooks is probably the best out there, in my opinion. Um, if you don't like QuickBooks for whatever reason, it's too expensive for you, whatever. Um, there are some other apps out there. Wave, FreshBooks um, are some options. Zero is another option, uh, X-E-R-O. Um, but I think that QuickBooks, by far, um, is the most um, consumer friendly. Okay. Uh, can you repeat what you said about using FEIE and FTC at the same time? In what situation could you use both? Correct. You cannot use them on the same income. So like if you only make if you only make $100,000, you're probably going to want to use the FEIE. You can only use the FEIE or the FTC. If you make more than the FEIE limit, right? So if you make $150,000 and the FEIE limit is $120,000, you can use 120,000 for the FEIE. And then for the 30,000 that doesn't qualify for FEIE, the excess, you can use the foreign tax credit. So you can stack them, but you can't use them together. I see. Um, are there benefits to having an LLC if you qualify for FEIE? Not really. The only benefit of an LLC is liability protection. There is no tax difference. Um, it is taxed exactly the same as a sole proprietor. The only thing that you have is the liability protection. So no tax benefits, but that liability protection can go a long way, especially if you have significant uh, personal assets. Um, do all countries have a dual tax agreement or 
No, uh, uh-uh, uh, no, this is definitely not. So you probably it's something that you want to look into in the countries that you travel to if you're spending more than six months in countries, right? If you're doing this hop one month, you probably don't have to worry about it. But if you're planning on spending more time in a country, you want to put more research into do they have the agreements that you need in place? I see. Um. Oh my goodness, I'm trying to read through all of these. There's so many good ones, and and yes, um, we have many questions about having a um, recording. We are recording, um, so don't worry if you didn't catch everything. You'll definitely be able to go um, back and um, and watch this again. Um, one more, I think we maybe have time for one or two more. If you're booking accommodations that have dedicated workspace and Wi-Fi, so you're paying a premium. Is any of that deductible? What about co-working memberships in each place that you travel? Co-working memberships are absolutely 100% deductible, right? So if that's an option that you have, or if you're booking something like a Selena, it gives you like access to a co-working space and living. See if you can get like a broken out receipt. I remember remote year, this is years ago. So if they don't still do it, please don't hold me to it. But they used to say X amount of your monthly fee is for co-working dedicated. So if you can get a uh, broken out receipt for that, that's great. If it's your Airbnb, do what you can to document that it has a dedicated workspace. Take pictures um, and make sure that you kind of have that on file if you ever get audited. Thank you so much. Um, again, this was a really uh, great presentation, a lot of really good information. Um, I, I'm sorry that we're not able to get to everybody's questions. Um, maybe we can do another session again in the future. Um, of course, we will send out um, all of the info about how you can uh, contact Crystal um, if you want to work uh, with her directly. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, if you have any questions for me um, about Outsight or what I do, um, you can simply reply to any of the emails that I've sent out to you or in, in the member hub. Um, and again, we will have, be having that meditation session in about 15 minutes. It's going to be a meditation with uh, a member of Outsight, a qualified meditation teacher. And we're going to um, meditate on the idea of abundance today. So after uh, this wonderful session on money and taxes, um, you know, get our get nice our follow up. Face. <laughs> yes, for sure. So uh, again, I'm Lindsay from Outsight. Um, and thank you so much uh, to Crystal for having this wonderful presentation for us. And uh, next time, maybe we'll have a little bit more time um, <laughs> to answer more questions. Uh, so I hope everyone has a great rest of their day or their evening, wherever they are, um, wherever you are in the world. And I hope to see you all at another uh, Outsight event. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you.